I need you.
Thank you, choir. Indeed, we are reminded of how we need the Lord, and particularly in times of trial. We're reminded of a trial here in Genesis chapter 22. You may still be seated, and we'll read Genesis chapter 2, 1 through 19, and uh, hear God's word as we look at it together. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Verse 3, So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him, Isaac and his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering, arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place far off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the sheep. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And so the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told them. And Abraham built an altar here or there and, and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said to him, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens and as the sands which it is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young man, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Grass withers and the flower fades. The word of our God stands forever. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to ask you the question this morning. Why are you here today? Is it to see what, what tangible things you can get from God? Maybe to put a little time in and, and get a good life, a little bit of blessing here or there. Or do you and I trust our triune God purely for who he is? Knowing that what we need here is a relationship, a life of faith with our sovereign, gracious God. That this matters most. In fact, you and I can test ourselves on this. You can ask yourself what I have to ask myself. If God would providentially take away the blessings I prize most in my life, my wife and my kids, if God took away my ability and removed the purpose for my life that as I love to serve uh, as a husband, as a father, as I love to serve you as your pastor, if he removed every one of these blessings and others from my life, would I still trust and praise God? Could you? Trust God's sovereign plan after losing everything a man or a woman can enjoy in this life? Would we be able to say with Job, though he slay me, yet I will trust him? As a child, I watched how one family had to face this question when a wife and a daughter were seriously injured in a car accident 
The man's daughter, though she was life flighted, did recover. But his wife Ruthie lived in a coma for over 10 years until she died and was buried on a very cold winter day. That day's still kind of emblazoned in my memory, actually. And that husband and their broader family were forced to trust God no matter what they lost. Many of you have faced similar heart-wrenching trials. How do we go on? If or when God calls us to face such loss, Well, this historical account teaches us how Abraham, our father in the faith, faced the most striking test God has ever issued to a human to sacrifice his son, forcing Abraham to love and trust God more than the temporal blessings of this life and teaching Abraham to know the same thing we should. That no matter what the test we face, no matter what the sacrifice is needed, no matter the future, the Lord will provide. This real event, this is a real historical event. Again, that's what Genesis do, is recounting for us. Even Jesus talks about Abraham as a real man, that he longed to see Christ's day, that this is pointing to Christ even. But here, first of all, the Lord teaches and provides tests It teaches us that he provides tests to strengthen our faith. The very first thing we read is this. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. And said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. God doesn't tell him it's a test. But as we look at this life of Abraham, I I think it would be easy to think God is is sending this test. Abraham could have thought this. God is sending this test to be cruel. I think sometimes we can think that too. But this event really is teaching about the depth of the love of God for his people. Because God will take our life. He'll use the different situations in our life to drive us as believers to love and trust him more and even to see how wonderfully he provides for us in ways that we could never have imagined. Yes, we live in a world where Satan does try to destroy us, but God will test us and we cannot deny that. Not to make us sin, not to make us stumble. James 1.13 tells us that. But it's to strengthen the faith he has placed in our heart. You think about it, 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 we've kind of gotten away from this, but you think of the old blacksmith that would heat the metal, and, and heat it red hot, and then bang on it, and then, then fold it over on itself, and heat it again, and bang it again, and then let it cool. And over and over he would do this to make that metal stronger and, and to fulfill the blacksmith's design. That's what God does perfectly with his people, even you and I, through testing in our life. Here Abraham was commanded, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering as one on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. I know the thought that God would command Abraham to make a bloody sacrifice of his son. Seems pretty incredible. Seems It's jarring to us. In fact, while Martin Luther was reading this passage, the reformer Martin Luther was reading this passage uh, for his family, Katie, his wife, cried out, I don't believe that God would never have treated his son like that. But Katie, Luther replied, he did. Luther said this because what's happening here, really, we have to understand, it is a divine picture, a, a, a type of what God did with Christ Jesus as he went to bear the cross and God's judgment for you and I. And God put this picture in the Old Testament, this hint of what he was going to do here, because the Lord sovereignly rules with an infinite knowledge of the future. He's able to control events. He's able to bring and guide people to fulfill his plan, all for our good and for his glory. And so God had this placed here and brought this event about in the life of Abraham, this test. 
point us to Christ. Now, Abraham didn't know this was a test. It, it, it didn't come with one of those warnings we often hear on the radio where you hear this tone, Doo, and it says, this is a test. And perhaps even as, as Abraham's mulling over this in his mind, he even felt like maybe we're tempted to, to feel that, that life has been hard enough. You think about it, Abraham already left his, his country, he left his family, he left Lot, uh, uh, Lot his, his nephew, he had left Ishmael. He had to let go of him. And at, at roughly somewhere around 115 years old, he could think maybe like we're tempted to think, well, you know, I'm old enough. Shouldn't I be able to go? Shouldn't I not have to face the hard things in life anymore? But see, God doesn't let Abraham live that way, and he doesn't let us live that way either. As Jim Elliott, the missionary who was killed in Ecuador, wrote, one does not surrender life in an instant. That which is lifelong can only be surrendered in a lifetime. And the God who put faith in our hearts will call us to surrender to him all of our life long. And he will refine that faith by the things we surrender. By the suffering you and I face. That's why Philippians 1.29 tells us, For to you it's been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him. You know, why do you believe it? It's because of Christ. It's a gift of God. That's not all that that passage says. Because it also says, But also to suffer for His sake. God has a hand. Not only in giving us our faith, God has a hand in testing us through suffering. And Abraham had to learn through all of God's promises and faithfulness. He, he had to learn even through his own failures leading up to this. To bring him to that point, he knew that no matter what, even if he, it didn't make sense what God was saying, he had to obey God. Notice too, the text doesn't tell us he didn't say, you know, this is such a big decision, Lord. We need to pray for a few days. No, like with us, if God commands us something, we don't need to pray about it. We need to obey. I'll say that again. If God commands us about something, we don't need to pray about it. We need to obey. That's hard. That's why God had already been working on Abraham to this point even as God works on us in our life. And so Abraham, this is an amazing thing in this passage. We see uh, he, he, with unquestioning faith, rose early, took Isaac, and took his two servants with him. And verse 3 even tells us that Abraham split the wood himself. You know, it would be so easy. God's made me do this, long, this thing. Let me go in the corner and mope, and, and you guys chop the wood. But Abraham does it. It's an image really... Of what God will do. Who is it that's made the trees? Made the hill? Made the iron ore that formed the nails and the spear? And God did all this knowing from eternity past that his son would be the only redeeming sacrifice for our sins on that wooden cross. God did it to save you and I. For three days, this passage tells us they trekked to Mount Moriah, or Mount Moriah, which, which means the Lord will provide. It was named after, as we read here in this passage. It was at, and, and this was be where the temple would be built, where sacrifices would be offered, and it was all very near the place where God the Son would be sacrificed for the sins of his people. And having made these, these preparations to do precisely as God commands, Abraham steps forward to make a bloody sacrifice of his son. And while God has not commanded us to sacrifice our children like this, some of us in the mystery of God's providence have had to give up our children. Some of us before they were born. Other of you when your children were much older. Others have lost a spouse. And yet in all of this, we cannot forget 
God is sovereignly and lovingly at work. We see that even here in this text. He is at work in these difficult tests to strengthen our faith and to provide. That's what the providence of God reminds us of. But even in adversity, God is still at work. And this brings us now, too, to the second point, that the Lord provides a sacrifice. Abraham doesn't have the benefit of places like Leviticus 18.21, commanding that, that, that there would be no child sacrifices. But he did confess earlier, if you remember, that he confessed in chapter 18 that the judge of all the earth will do right. And so when Abraham tells his servants in verse 5 to stay, he adds this. He says, the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Abraham here says this without the benefit of knowing how Jesus raised the dead or, or how Jesus rose from the grave. But Abraham, as, as Hebrews 11 tells us, Trust that God will fulfill the promises he made to Isaac to continue the covenant line. And the only thing Abraham can imagine is that God is going to raise his son even after he sacrifices him, even after he dies. That's why he told the man, we will return. Now Isaac is a lad, as this text says, and he's probably between 12 and 17 years old. And Abraham lays the wood on Isaac's back, just as God the Father will lay the cross on Christ. And as they go, Isaac realizes they don't have a sacrifice. He says in verse 11, er, and, and Abraham replies, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Abraham knows he had been a failure before God. He knew he deserved to lose his son, to lose all the blessings. And yet at the same time, he, he, God uh, helps Abraham to see something that we need to understand too. That you and I can't make the sacrifice for our sins. Why are we here? Because we need God. We need what he provides. We need his redeeming grace. Abraham understands that. And as they finally arrive at the place God commanded, we read something incredible, at least to me, and I was always incredible as a kid when I heard this. Verse 9, he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took his knife to slay his son. What's amazing is Isaac doesn't complain or protest. He doesn't wrestle away. In this way, too, Isaac is really pointing to Christ because Jesus looking to the cross doesn't wrestle as God the Son with God the Father, but he says in John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And Jesus talks about how that was a happy thing to do. But here, Isaac's not wrestling. Abram must have explained what was to happen. And this lad trusted his father and trusted his father's God. And when Abraham had that knife, that is a, and it's descriptive for making a sacrifice, it's designed for this. When he has this knife and was ready to plunge it down, God stopped him and said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Something important here. Because God at times will tell you and I something in his word we will not like. And, and it's not because God doesn't understand or doesn't know our hearts. He does. But he'll tell us to do something which is hard at times. He may make us go through something we do not understand. And yet God does understand. 
And in the end, our hope is not that we can figure out somehow through this maze of, uh, of confusing trials or tears or troubles. And we need to trust the Lord because he's working. He's going to make our faith clear, our strengths clear, as well as our weaknesses. And we need to trust even as Abraham was trusting that the Lord will provide. He'll provide whatever ultimately we need. And here the Lord provided a sacrifice, a ram caught in the thicket. And different from what ultimately will happen to Christ, Christ as he's going to the cross did not say there's another way. No, Jesus said, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Isaac didn't have to offer his son because God offered his son. Jesus went to the cross to bear God's wrath for all your and my sins, past, present, and future. And he cried out even, it is finished. So we would know God has provided the complete sacrifice for our sins. And we need to argue that again and again to our hearts. Because we have a struggle in this life that we're so tempted to think in, in our trials, well, well God, I, I'm, I'm paying for this sin or for that. This person or that has died in my life and I'm facing this problem because I know you're getting me for this sin. But see, God has provided the sacrifice for our sins. And it's Jesus, in Jesus, that our sins are paid for in full. And yes, God will chasten us for the sins of the past through various trials. But God's purpose for Abraham is the same as it is for you and I as believers. God means to test us, to refine our faith, to prove our faith, to strengthen it, to reveal it to us, to prove and force us to the point where we say, yes, I need to obey the Lord, even if I don't understand why. Because in the end, the Lord will provide, including the sacrifice we need. Lastly, and very, very briefly here, the Lord provides also a future. We see this as God, in verse 16 through 18, makes an oath on himself, takes an oath, and he blesses Abraham, who surrendered to God in faith. And God repeats what, what he's already promised before, but he fills in a little bit more, promising to multiply Abraham's descendants, to make him a great nation, to bring the Savior through him, which, which all nations of the earth will be blessed. And I know we didn't read it, but you can read this later here this week. Verses 20 through 24. While this trial is going on over here, what's happening over here? You read that Abraham's brother is having children, and God was faithfully working to provide a future bride, Rebecca, for Isaac. That's important. Because what's our temptation? When we face a trial, so often we think, well, God, you, you've let go of me. You've stopped working in my life. But God is still working in so many ways that we cannot imagine. He's working in all of our trials. And God's sovereign purpose, no matter the test he puts us through, is to bless us, not ultimately even in this life, but in eternity through Christ Jesus, our crucified and risen Lord. See, the Lord provides. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the story is told one dark stormy night as a family was crammed in their car. They came on a couple that Turns out, we're walking by the side of the road, and, and then they saw, too, they had a young child. And they asked if they could help, and, and found out this couple's house had just burned down, and they barely escaped with their lives, and they were walking to the next town, to their sister's house. And, and the family in the car felt terrible because they were packed in there. They couldn't take them, and, and they couldn't leave their kids on the side of the road either. And, and, and so they gave them $20 and then drove away. And then, then after a little bit, as they drove, they kind of talked, and they said, well, how much money do we have? And they came up with an extra $100. And so they, they went back to this young couple, 
And the man says, can I have that 20 back, that $20 back? Perplexed, the, the lady said, sure. The man then combined that with all the money they had and gave them $120. I know it's a simple illustration, but it illustrates how God often beats us. He gives us so many good things. He, he gives us often our heart's desires, like, like with Isaac. That was Abraham's heart's desire. And then he asked for it back at times. Those earthly possessions, those blessings we treasure most. But God does that ultimately to, to give us in the end much more in return. To give us himself and a blessed eternity. Not so we can make idols of those blessings, of those things. But so that we could be amazed with this God and enjoy him. Who has loved you and I so much. Who did not spare his only begotten son, but gave him up for us all. And our response has to be that, that, that Isaac Watts said, or put in the hymn, saying, Love so amazing, love so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Give yourself and all that is precious to you. Give it to the Lord. He will provide, even in testing, and even for the future, providing what is not only good, but the best for you through Christ his Son. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word which shows the Christian life is one of testing. And it shouldn't surprise us. But it's also a life of obedience and faith. And we ask that as those children of, of our father Abraham, the seed of Abraham, that you would give us the faith that Abraham had to love and trust you no matter what we might have or not have in this earthly life. Make us to believe that no matter what you bring us through or bring us to, that you will provide, as you already have through Christ your Son, no matter the, what temporal blessings we may have to give up, you've given us salvation. And one day you will raise the dead because of Christ's resurrection because his victory over the grave. Help us to live our lives in this sure hope, Lord, that the Lord will provide. In Jesus' name we pray.